A note to listeners, Straight Up Care and Reduce the Stigma intentionally avoids stigmatizing language. However, we do not censor the language of individuals with lived and living experience. We respect their right to use the words they prefer. Welcome to Reduce the Stigma, brought to you by Straight Up Care. Today we have an episode of Recovery Conversations, a series that raises up the voices of those with lived and living experience, as well as the people and organizations supporting them. Hello and welcome to Recovery Conversations. I'm Whitney Minarchek, and with me today is Amory Mallory. So Amory, tell me, what is it about recovery stigma that brought you to meet with me today? And what can we talk about? What is it that you would like to share? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me again. And, um, you know, I just, any conversation around recovery and mental health um, that can help bring awareness to people's lived experiences and to just the topic and bring it out into light is something that I'm always, I'm always interested in talking about and invested in, in seeing. So, um, if anytime anybody asks me to come and talk about, you know, my lived experience uh, as a person in recovery or, um, you know, just what that looks like in the world and, and how we move through the world, I'm, I'm always stoked on it. Well, thank you because, you know, that's a big part of, of, being able to bust any stigma and raise awareness is just sharing stories. It's the best way to kind of break down barriers is to show the person behind the experience. Um, so I appreciate your willingness to kind of to go there. Um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, what is that lived experience you've had? Yeah, for sure. So, um, gosh, I, I, you know, uh, move through the experience of you know of addiction and mental health struggles from a pretty young age um growing up in the bay area and um you know and and then having moved through a lot of different forms of institutions you know um encounters with legal institutions um you know treatment centers outpatient residential inpatient you know psychiatric support um you know all kinds of different touch points with the system and um and a lot of a lot of um struggling during that time and uh and then i I spent some time in new york and ended up working with a peer advocate and that was kind of the missing link for me was to work with somebody who had lived experience and alongside a lot a lot of other forms of support um alongside medication alongside you know uh, work with a therapist and alongside good family support which i was blessed to have um but but to have that connection with somebody who um who really another you know young man who really knew what it was like to move through uh, addiction and then move through recovery um that really kind of it was that missing link for me to help uh, help me step into recovery that's great and what how would you describe the difference the the role that the peer advocate played in your journey yeah it's a great question um I think for me, it was just, um, that, like at, at that point in time in my life, is it, I was, um, 20 years old when I, when I first, you know, entered recovery and for when I started my long-term sustained recovery. Um, and at the time, I just don't think I was very trusting of a lot of providers. Um, not that I thought that they were necessarily bad intentioned or I just didn't really feel like people understood me. I think that's probably a pretty common thing for a lot of people with addiction and mental health struggles and also a common thing for a lot of uh, teenagers or, or young adults. And so the, the culmination of the two made me particularly distrusting. And, um, and it, you know, it was one of those things where it's like, you, you can't bullshit a bullshitter, you know what I mean? Like where he was really able to just call me on it and be like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't run circles around him. I couldn't like try and be like, you don't understand. You don't get it. You don't know what it's like. He was like, I really do actually. And, um, and I have a solution for you if you're willing to listen, you know? And that was, um, that was, I think really the difference to me was that this was somebody who could, um, you know, didn't have quite as strict of clinical boundaries about what they could divulge about their own personal stories, a therapist or psychiatrist might, uh, somebody who could disclose, you know, their lived experience in a very significant way. 
and then somebody who could also spend time with me in the community in a way that was different than a therapist or a doctor might. So it was not just this wasn't somebody I was meeting in an office for an hour. This was somebody who spent time in my home that took me out of the community that really was like a, you know, a, 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 a liaison or a guide through life in a, in a very different way. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's an interesting point talking about going into the community because with traditional services, the more professional with the degree professionals, um, it, it does it, it ends at the door, which pros and cons to that, right? I understand privacy and, and you know, boundaries, uh, but that's then only addressing one part of a person's life when, you know, maybe it's for 15 minutes you're with that provider, but then you have the rest, what, 23 hours and 45 minutes of your day to get through. Um, so what were some of the things that, that out in the community that your peer helped you with? Yeah. I mean, um, this is really just like how to live life sober. Right. So I remember being like, you know, like, how do you go through a day sober? Mm -hmm. And I remember him being like, you just do all the things that you do while you're getting high, but you just don't get high before you do them. You know what I mean? That, that blew my mind. Right. So like going out to a restaurant, right. This is just it you just eat instead of getting high and then eating, you know what I mean? So it was like really a lot of different aspects. And um, so, you know, we would go out and play, you know, play some golf or we would go and he would take me to like poker nights with a bunch of his, you know, friends that were in recovery. So he had a good, you know, network of people in recovery, um, and a bunch of young men, you know, that was, that was a young men and women, but there was a strong, you know, connection of young men there, kind of like a stag style. Um, maybe just for reference, a stag meeting would be a, you know, a, an AA group or a peer support group that's, that's all men. Um, and so, you know, just like a strong community of young men that were in recovery. And so we would do all kinds of things together. Like I said, you know, we'd go to a meeting and then fellowship afterwards. And I'm not a, I'm not a, a big book thumper. I, I'm not saying the full steps are the only way by any means, but that was one aspect of it, right? You know, you go to a meeting, talk about recovery, and then afterwards go on fellowship in a way that was really well connected. Uh, so he kind of plugged me in to like, hey, here's a great meeting and here's a great group of guys. And then beyond that, too, like, oh, we're all going to go out and, you know, uh, go play around at golf on Sunday. We're having a poker night. We're going to watch, you know, watch the game, watch the fights at our house or have a potluck like dinner, you know. Um, and being a, like a sober companion or, a, you know, a, co a coach or an advocate through that process, um, especially in the beginning, you know, it, as things kind of progress and I move through my recovery, that sort of separate a little bit and it was like okay he can step back and let me kind of just run my own path but in the beginning of those first couple months of recovery when it's so um scary and tender and fresh and you don't know how to do anything you know what i mean um right. and so raw having somebody there to navigate that was super important i can imagine it makes me think about um I am not a person with lived experience with substance use. I have a, uh, my own lived experience with mental health, um, but I've worked with individuals with substance use. And I it always struck me when they would talk about having to redesign their days and uh, what to do with the time that's no longer being sent, spent on, on obtaining, using, recovering, etc. And I think that's something that a lot of people who don't have that lived experience really overlook. And, and dismiss the impact of, okay, here you are. And yeah, a lot of the things you're going to do the same restaurants, things like that, but there's a, it's, it's different. Um, yep. And it can take a, my understanding is that it can take a while to adjust to that new normal, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you really, it's, um, it's a strange thing to think about. Like I really didn't know how to, what a day looked like well like a, a normal day looked like right like i had to relearn how to live in a certain way you know what i mean like all the ports were there like i knew how to go to a restaurant i knew how to play golf right now you know what i mean like i knew how to do these things sort of individually but to string them together in a day what how do you actually like what does a functional day look like like what are normal eating times what's a normal sleeping habit like how do you interact with people all those pieces were sort of there <clears throat> you know, in a, in a semi-functional way, you know, but to string them together, like, multiple days and weeks and months in a row was foreign. It was a foreign day. I'd never done that before. Like, like, I started using pretty seriously as a, you know, as a young teenager, 
Um, so for all of my you know, adult life, so to speak, um, or my young adult life, any time where you'd be learning those things and how to navigate life in that way was, I never had any experience with that. It was a totally brand new concept to me. Right. It makes me think of um, also, uh, I've worked in the criminal justice system and they talk a lot about, about rehabilitation, but it, in many ways, it's just habilitation. It's totally. teaching skills. Yeah. And yeah. that's hard. I mean, yeah. having to cope with triggers and cravings. And then on top of that, going from almost like zero to 100 on like adult responsibilities kind of stuff. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's also like just somebody who I could, like I said, I mean, the, tr the trust part was such a big thing, you know, like. To me, the idea of like somebody asking you to get sober is effectively like asking you to jump out of an airplane without a parachute and just trust them. Like, right? Like, this is your entire safety net, the things that have kept you alive and functional, maybe not effective anymore, but at some point in time, it was there for, like, that was there for a reason that, that use or that, those ways that we learn how to navigate the pain and suffering and our experience of the world. And so, you know, if, if somebody's never done that before and they ask you to do it, it's like, I don't really, I'm not sure if I'm going to live through this, actually. I don't really believe that you know for a fact that this is going to be okay. But somebody's like, I've done this like five times. I've already jumped out of the plane five times. And I promise you it'll be okay. Um, and if you can trust the person and, and come to know them and have some faith in them, that's such a huge, huge, huge part for me. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned that you were also so young um, whenever you started. And I, I, can't help but think that that would be a key part for any teen any young adult that you have someone that isn't like this authority figure um because there's just that natural desire to kind of pull away and, and become an individual on for your own so to have someone who can talk to you in a different way and not be like you have to do this or you're gonna i'm gonna mandate something um probably just resonates different too for sure yeah I mean, autonomy is so important to, to, to developing, you know, young adults and to, and anybody remotely authoritative is going to be rebelled against, even if they're, what they're saying makes sense. You know what I mean? Um, that was definitely a big part too, for sure. Yeah. Um, and also somebody who could just kind of call me on my shit when I would do that, you know, in a certain way, a therapist, and again, for better or for worse, you know, I, I, my, my therapists were so valuable to me and I have so much respect for what they do. And it's just different. It's just, different parts of the puzzle right but therapists might not be able to call you in the same way you know that a, that a peer can yeah yeah and what does that do for then the person to be called out in that way well for me like you know it was interesting like um like the final sort of call out for me was that <laughs> he was just like look man I'm not going to, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't work with you anymore. Like I just couldn't get it. You know, I was, I just couldn't get it. I had been working with you for a couple months and, and I was just pushing the boundaries hard and not like boundaries in terms of, you know, you know, ethics, but boundaries in terms of like really pushing back against him, you know, really testing the waters. Like, can I trust this person? Right. Like is this person, can, can they, can they be the support? Right. Really. You're testing him. Yeah. That. Yeah, totally. And eventually it was like, He's like, dude, look, I'm just a person. Like, this isn't like I love you, but I'm not. I'm not doing this with you. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and the idea of somebody else, of losing somebody important to me again because of my use, um, and the ability for him to just be like, I'm, I'm walking on this. Um, that was a call out, right? Like that was like his call, being like, I'm calling you out on this, dude. Like, I'm not this behavior. Like, not okay for, for uh, this relationship, you know? And uh, that was actually, I think, the thing that really kicked me into. A, um, my first like serious attempt at recovery because I just was not willing to lose that person again, you know, or a person that was important to me again. And then, you know, and there was plenty of other sort of call outs like that before where you're just really able to be like, dude, what you're doing just isn't like, this is not the way, you know what I mean? In a way that was just, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it was just different than any other provider had been able to really do for me before it, to really make me like look at my behavior in a way that I think probably because it wasn't authoritative, right? Like <clears throat> I didn't feel like he, I didn't feel like he was attacking me or like, um, I didn't feel the need to rebel against the call out. I was just like, damn dude, like I'm just hurting this person I care about. That sucks. You know? 
Wow. That's so interesting and just really moving uh, that he, you know, a lot of times people don't want to put boundaries. They think that boundaries are way, are like unloving, but here's this person that you respected, that you cared about, who cared about you. And he, by putting a boundary, that's what really ki- like clicked for you. You were like, oh shit. No, yeah. I, I like bound. Sometimes those boundaries are necessary. Oh, it's this, this is such a diff. It's like the most important part, I think. But you know, in the work that I do now, working in the field, and and ever since, the hardest part for me has been working with families and trying to help them navigate boundaries for loved ones with with this. Because like my family um, set a boundary when I was that I could not live in their home, and so for some time I was homeless, and then my grandparents took me in, and ultimately them setting that boundary is what got me into treatment for the first time and kind of planted the seed. It didn't stick that time, but if they hadn't set that boundary, I would probably not have had the motivation to change. Um, maybe I would. I mean, who knows? But it was, it was really painful at the time. But it, but it, looking back on it, it was probably the best thing they ever did for me. Um, and I, I get so many film, and I, but it's, it's such a, um, like even after years of working in the field, I don't really have like a good answer when parents are like, should I? let them keep staying in the house like how firm of a boundary should i set and i'm like i don't know right like it's it happened to work for me but it's really is like um that that tough love versus like the compassion and just letting it like i'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me and people would fall on both sides of the spectrum about what the right thing to do is but i never know how to advise family when they're like what do i do and like you do what you think you're going to be what you can live with you know yeah, I mean, I think that's all you can. There's definitely no cookie cutter boundary. Um, and at the end of the day, we're not the ones living with the decision. So how can you tell someone? Uh, yeah, boundaries are important and it, they can be very helpful, but it doesn't. Man, it's not easy. I mean, people in no. with regardless of substance use have a hard time with boundaries. So totally. let's recognize that. But they're like, I think like the ability to like know where your boundaries are and set them well and then stick by them wherever you choose to put them, I think is one of the most important things in healing family dynamics that contribute to continued, you know, substance use or other, other, you know, mental health challenges. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's an interesting point. Like it doesn't have to be, you can never live with me again, but maybe the, the boundary is you cannot show up after midnight kind of thing. And if you stick to that, you're, I don't know, boundaries are, are, can be like, I think of them like bumper bowling. It can help someone kind of navigate until they get on their path. Uh, because we're, we're not setting people up for success if they don't know what to expect. So boundaries are just another way of just saying, Hey, here's a little bit of like guidelines. Um, you'll be successful if you kind of just stick with them for a little bit kind of thing. Totally. I also, I really do think that substance use is a family dynamic thing, right? Like obviously the individual has to take accountability and responsibility, but I think that, you know, family systems, even if it's not biological family, but, you know, sort of family systems being the people that we surround ourselves with, blood or or choice, um, learn to have this homeostasis, right? Uh, Like the ability to sort of self-moderate based on history, right? So like even well-intentioned or you know are find people are finding ways that that support the use of the because that's historically what it's always been right so it's learned how to adopt to that and so i think family members setting setting boundaries and it, again it doesn't matter where they are right like you could ask their choice personally of where to put the boundary but but sort of starting to reorient that homeostasis into a point of like continuity or you know or, or structure um that doesn't that's that we're, we're not just playing through the old stories and the old patterns that have allowed this this behavior to manifest and exist for right. however long years or decades i think it's like a it's a super important step in changing in changing that dynamic right yeah. it comes back to what you said there's it served a purpose it dealt with pain, um, even if it, the functionality of it was minimal or short-lived. And if the um, some of the 
causing factors, certainly not putting it on the families entirely. But if some of those behaviors that led to it in the first place aren't addressed, it's just going to be, again, setting someone up for failure, um, trying to put someone back in the same setting without any of that changing. Um, it can't just be them. Yes, they have to take ownership and, and make those changes, just like we all do. And then how do others adapt to best support that person's success? Right. Yeah, it's not at all about fall. It's just the reality. It's like, okay, if you have a puzzle, I think about it like a family is a jigsaw puzzle. You know, if you have a jigsaw puzzle and you have one piece, this the the, the addict, or and you take them out and you change sort of change the piece, you know, put them in treatment, and ask them to adapt who they are, and then come back to the family system jigsaw puzzle. It's much more likely that that one piece will readapt to fit the puzzle than the whole puzzle will readapt to fit them, unless the whole puzzle is actively trying to do that right so unless right. the whole family is is working on those dynamics um again well-intentioned or not chances are that the individual is going to fall back into that years or decades old pattern of that they've learned um and i think that yeah so i it was not used to be yeah. too esoteric about the whole thing but i do think that'd be no. really important <laughs> <laughs> well i think there's just so much there and could easily go down the rabbit hole with you on that one but, um, because there's a lot of a lot put on the person and again have to take accountability and 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 do it for yourself and think and like have that internal desire um but also you know we have to recognize the play the the impact that systems have family systems uh community systems like we can't just say oh it's you that's very minimizing. Um, so definitely right with you on that. Uh, and as a professional who's in recovery and working in the field, um, you know, historically, there hasn't always been respect for that lived experience. Um, and there's more and more awareness of the value, uh, finally. And what would be, I'm just curious, what would be something that you would want a healthcare professional to know uh, who may not have that lived experience? That's a great question. Yeah, you're right. It, it's funny, you know, substance use, like, in basically every way lags about 20 years behind other movements, right? Like, <laughs> vets have known peers, end of experience, like, you know, that's important. Mental health has been doing peers, a lived right. experience, and substance use is finally like, oh, maybe, oh. you know, finally starting to see that maybe we have a value too, uh, which is great, you know? Um, yeah, but in terms of what I would want to provide or no, I don't, that's a great question, you know? I think it's like, I don't know how to really crystallized it into one like you know it's like a decade of of moving through that world it's like how, okay what is the one how does that crystallize into one thing um i think it's really just about i would want just providers to examine their biases right like the biases i mean that's just true across the board right but like each right. person is going to have a unique based i mean probably every provider that does have lived experience has probably been around a family or a loved one that does so they're carrying some bias, just like we're all carrying some form of bias. And so the question is just how much of that bias are you projecting onto every individual you meet who fits that sort of category? Um, and I think it's just with historically marginalized or disenfranchised populations, it's, it's easier to, to not look at your bias, like to just dismiss it, because that's what the conditioning is. Like these people are all the same and they all fit this one thing. They're all they're all drug seeking or they're all, you know, don't want to be in treatment or they all, whatever, the, whatever you had with your person <laughs> that you're now projecting onto everybody else. Um, that That's just the main thing. It's just like really examine the bias because I don't know if there's any one thing that can be crystallized from people's lived experience. Yeah. 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 And hopefully there will be health professionals who hear that because <laughs> it's got it. It's so important. Um, so thank you. I know that was like kind of like curveball for you. So I appreciate no, you going no there with me. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I have, I bring a ton of bias in. Like I have to constantly check my bias, not because I want to, but because that's just the nature of being human, right? Like it right. blows my mind that like me, like I have to do this. I do this all the time with my clinical director where I'm like, I'll start to get like frustrated with one of my clients. I'm like, why don't they just get it? You know, I'm like, that's insane. Like I, didn't get it so many times and the only reason i ended up getting it um 
for today at least is because somebody didn't carry that bias into the picture right somebody saw me as as still having a chance right and it's just crazy that like even with years of lived experience and doing all these trainings and helping other people now still like come to the table and be like they just don't want it enough and i, I catch myself pretty quickly you know what i mean but i'm like wow you know if, if that's if that's happening for me that people who don't have that lived experience must be really pervasive again not bad intentions just the nature of being human absolutely yeah so before we wrap up i do have one more question for you if and this may be another one that's hard to kind of get down into one but if people could take one thing away from our discussion what would you like it to be i don't know we kind of went all over the place sorry <laughs> we did we um did. i don't know uh let's just treat everybody like a human <laughs> you know approach everybody with compassion and and you know understanding that everybody is coming you know with their own unique story as you know as spoiler plate or cliche as that sounds um you know i think the, the whole sort of i guess topic of this it is it is some stigma right like that's what this your organization about is reducing stigma and i think um that's really where like we have to sort of fundamentally just start over every time we meet somebody right like okay this is a new person brand new experience and the kind of like the same do with the providers like what what am i bringing into this as the person who's witnessing you know and i think that um the more that we can kind of start over with that like childlike curiosity of who this person is and and you know all the things that they're bringing to the table um is is probably our best shot at, at giving them their best shot. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Child curiosity. I think we could yeah. benefit from that in like so many ways. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, that's kind of the, like a little bit of the Buddhist or the Eastern philosophy of like approaching every situation like it's your first time seeing it. You know, it's like, wow, if this was my if this was my first time experiencing this moment, what would it be like? You know, if this is my first time meeting a person all the curiosity and all the understanding and compassion and none of the bullshit <clears throat> you know obviously that's a little bit easier said than done but <laughs> sure would be nice wouldn't yeah. it it would be <laughs> and hopefully we can all take that and at least for the rest of today yeah. apply it uh yeah. and make it a new habit and then it just becomes routine that's the hope well Thank you so much, Amory. I really enjoyed talking with you, uh, and I'm just excited to hopefully hear about what you're up to moving forward, and please come back anytime uh, so we can keep talking, keep learning. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and, and for the, all the work that you're doing for the community and for, um, and for, you know, for us. So. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please join us on our mission to reduce the stigma by liking, sharing, and leaving us a review. You can watch our full episodes on our Amazon Fire and Roku TV channels, as well as at ReduceTheStigma.com. Reduce the Stigma is hosted by me, Whitney Minarchek, edited by Sarah Elash, and music by Audiosphere. This has been a Straight Up Care production.